welcome Dr. Daryl Sanchez as our speaker. Um, just a quick introduction of Daryl. He's uh, from the Directed Energy Directorate at, a, at the Air Force Research Laboratory where he directs the uh, Assault Lab. And I always have to look up the long name. It's the Atmospheric Simulation and Adaptive Optics Laboratory at uh, the uh, Directed Energy Directorate. Daryl has been involved in, uh, in uh, beam control and in imaging for most of his career, probably all of it, since he was a graduate from the Air Force Academy. He got his PhD from University of New Mexico, mm -hmm. and uh, he has been uh, at AFRL a lot of that time. He's a member of the Directed Energy Professional Society and the Optical Society of America. And today, Dr. Sanchez will be presenting a talk entitled Turbulence, Branch Points, and OAM, the Whole Universe is Spinning. So please join me welcoming uh, Dr. Daryl Sanchez. All right. Thanks, Kat. All right, well, sorry I'm late. I went to the wrong place. I guess I'm not used to walking around big cities, so. Anyway, so uh, thank, thank you, Kent. You know, I really appreciate uh, being invited here. You know, uh, Kent's been funding us for a lot of years in the assault lab to do work in propagation through the atmosphere. And this is sort of a culmination of, of where we are. It's a snapshot, I guess. I'm going to take you up to a snapshot of where we are now in our research. So. Uh, as uh, Kent said, the talk's going to be about uh, branch points and OAM and with a bit of application to uh, uh, astrophysics. So with that then, all right, I believe I just said that, uh, branch points. Do I have a laser pointer um, with a button? Nope. All right. So anyway, we're going to talk about, uh, I'm going to first talk about uh, propagation through turbulence, talk about weak turbulence, I'm going to talk about strong turbulence. That's going to take about 10 minutes. Uh, then I'm going to jump into branch points, and then I'm going to talk about the turbulence-induced photonic OEM, and then I'm going to have an application to astrophysics. So with that, uh, so what do we mean, propagation through uh, uh, in turbulence? Uh, for instance, if I had an observatory sitting on the top of a mountain, well situated, sitting on top of a mountain, I had a point source, a star going through the atmosphere, uh, what we would see, this is the propagation through turbulence. This is propagation through weak turbulence. So, and we find that images are degraded when we do this. Why are images degraded? And images are degraded because of atmospheric turbulence. Turbulence causes phase distortions. The phase uh, uh, distortions cause degradation in image quality and the result is fuzzy images. So we want to do something about this. Um, so what do we do? We jump off a cliff here in talking equations. Uh, so we actually want to solve this. And this is where they were about uh, 20 years ago. And uh, what we'd like to do is, yes, it degrades images. But what we'd like to do then is come up with a predictive solution. And given that we have a predictive solution, given that we have a predictive solution, then we can actually start designing systems, perhaps, that can compensate for the turbulence. So. So what I'm going to do here is actually go through about 10 minutes sort of standard theory of where we are. Uh, at the bottom of these charts here, you're going to see a reference uh, if you're interested. I'm not going to go in very detail on any of these. But at the bottom, you'll see a reference. It'll be a nice citation. You can go look it up and find out more if you'd like to. So, so we begin with Maxwell's equations, standard uh, Maxwell's equations, MKS units. Uh, mu is equal to 1 for the atmosphere, the permeability. We have a time and spatially varying permittivity. And we have here the index of refraction, which is given by the permittivity over the free space permittivity. We make the assumptions of source free, uh, so rho and j are equal to 0. And we also have the fact that n of r is a random variable. And this n of r being a random variable showing up actually in this equation right here actually causes problems. And these are the problems that we have to deal with. This is why it's not an, it was not an easy problem 20 years ago. So, uh, so we begin with Maxwell's equations. We can get to a Helmholtz equation. I'll just take it. So here's the vector Helmholtz equation. This can actually go in standard form. This is what you usually see when people talk about the wave equation. It's the Helmholtz equation in scalar. So uh, given by this expression here. So Maxwell's equation, the Helmholtz equation. From the Helmholtz equation, we get the Riccati equation, which is we make this substitution here in the scalar equation, e to the phi, and we can solve this to get what is known as the Riccati equation. So Maxwell's equation, Helmholtz equation, Riccati equation. Now at this point, uh, we need
need to make an approximation in order to solve the problem. Uh, and the approximation that's made, a standard approximation that's made is a Rickoff approximation. It's a second order multiplicative approximation, which I'm showing right here. Actually, here's the full expansion. Here's the, the, the it's additive until you put it back into the U equation. Second order multiplicative equation, so Ritthoff approximation. With the Ritthoff approximation, we can then solve for the phi equation and get two more expressions. The first expression can easily be shown to be the free space wave equation, and the second one takes a bit more work. The bit more work is you pop, you can use the Green's function and get a solution here. So now what we've done then is we have a solution then, here is the scalar wave equation, the, the variable of the scalar wave equation. And what we have then is we have propagation to the atmosphere, we have turbulence, and now we have a predictive solution for this. The trouble is, in order to do this, the disturbance must be known. So at this point, we go to the work of Kolmogorov. Uh, we make some assumptions about the index of refraction. What Kolmogorov showed is that the atmosphere is best described by a structure function. The Kolmogorov then in the inertial range or in a quasi-static solution is given by this expression here, where I have a C sub n squared and an R to the two-thirds. And this is what Kolmogorov did. C sub n squared is the turbulence strength. Uh, it can be attained from experiment. People have done that and gotten the Huffnagel Valley and the clear one. These are the two most famous examples that people use all the time. And so now we actually have a structure function and a strength, and given the structure functions, now here's a structure function, Kolmogorov, this can be integrated to get what people call the Kolmogorov spectrum. And people always talk about Kolmogorov turbulence, Kolmogorov turbulence, well, there it is right there. So uh, kappa to the 11 thirds, the spectrum to the 11 thirds. Uh, this assumes this where, where their scales are infinitely small and infinitely large. We know physically that that's not, uh, a correct solution. We have to have both an inner scale and an outer scale. Uh, one of the spectra, which is a derivative of this that actually does that, is the von Karman or the modified von Karman spectrum, which is shown here. And you're going to need to remember this. I'm going to come back to this uh, later in the talk when we begin talking about OAM and the creation of OAM. So we have an outer scale and an inner scale, and it truncates both sides of the spectrum. So. So we have Maxwell's equations, Helmholtz equations, the Riccati equation, the Ritthoff approximation, and now a spectrum. Now, given that, then we can actually, the solution then reduces to a two-degree integral, one of the strength and one of the spectrum. And what was done back in the day was to actually show that there's, four, uh, as I said, you have a star atmosphere, images are degraded. So with these parameters here, moments of the strength of the uh, turbulence uh, you can show that there are four parameters that determine uh, how bad the image is degraded. Uh, one is the scintillation parameter, known as Ritthoff, named for Ritthoff. We have Freed's parameter. <coughs> this is a phase uh, size parameter. Uh, we have isoplanetic patch and Greenwood frequency. From these four parameters, then, you can now have a predictive solution. And now, what we were talking, if you recall, when I started, we have weak propagation through weak turbulence that causes degradations. We want to be able to solve for these degradations. So they did that. Um, what I, I'm showing here are uh, closed loop performance. So what I have up here are two sort of fuzzy images, uncompensated images. This is of the trapezium nebula. Uh, th this is famous to astronomers. Uh, here a picture of Saturn, obviously famous to everybody. Uh, so without adaptive optics or without the predictive solution from the weak turbulence regime, we get these images here with adaptive optics we can actually start seeing that we correct. Though it causes degradations, the theory is well enough known that we can actually then use it to create devices that, that fix the badness. And in here, what was a fuzzy blob, we start seeing actually structure. And this is ionized hydrogen in here. This is gonna become important when we talk about application to astrophysics. Uh, so the clouds here, this is um, a Theta Orionis C, ionizes the clouds, and that's why we can see it. What we're interested in in the astrophysical one will be the one that's not ionized. We have here a prediction of Saturn. Obviously, here's the moon Rhea and a very nice uh, uh, compensated image of Saturn. So what we have then in standard theory, so Maxwell's equations, you know, Helmholtz, <coughs> Riccati equation, then two approximations, the Kolmogorov um, and, and uh, the Ritthoff approximation, and we're actually able to come up with a very nice theory. But there's trouble in paradise. And 
this is really what Kent's been starting to hint at, what Kent's been funding us to do for the last you know, four, four years or so. So what happens then when I start propagating through uh, longer turbulence? You know, you had the observatory at the top of the mountain. Now, now we need to go, let's say it's not there, we may have to propagate through, through additional turbulence. What happens? So longer paths for the atmosphere. We have higher supermen squared. Now two things actually start to happen. One is scintillation appears in the beam. So this is captured by the Rickhoff parameter. And second of all, uh, interestingly enough, a new term appears in the phase. And this is what David Freed quantifiably showed in 1998. So the new component in the phase is given by this. So now if you go back to the two geometries, the geometry of I'm kind of looking through a thin atmosphere, I only have one type of phase and a very small, there's no scintillation in the beam. When I get in this other geometry, I have scintillation and I also have a second component in the phase. So this phase is called the hidden phase by Freed. This is a seminal paper. I really, every time I go back and read this, it's actually quite, he wrote it wonderfully. Uh, so, but interestingly enough, the Rickhoff parameter, which is the scintillation parameter, actually gives us, characterizes this, the appearance of this other term in the phase, interestingly enough. So what? That's why you're sitting there now and you're just going, so what? Well, I'm not gonna answer, so I'm gonna answer so what in the next slide. So it was shown very early on, prior to you know, David even showing this, that there's a second component in the phase, that this phase here that he calls LMS in his 1998 paper is the optimal phase for adaptive optics. So if you use this, the, the, the phase that appears there, throw away everything else, you're gonna get the best performance you can possibly get. And so, so that's one note. Second note here, the, the gradients. Now if I take the gradients in the total phase, what David really showed was that the gradients are orthogonal, and they're orthogonal in terms of Stokes theorem. In the sense, if I take the gradients, now I have a del dot and a del cross. So I integrate them back, and these two phases are orthogonal. I, if you're a mathematician, you're probably saying they can't be orthogonal because they're not vectors. I agree, but I'm not a mathematician. So I have two phases here. And what Terry Brennan showed later then was that these two <laughs> sets of phases are somehow they're grouped in Hilbert spaces that associated with these gradients are two Hilbert spaces. There's an LMS uh, Hilbert space. So this is H tote is H LMS and this is a CERT plus HSD. So I have, it's uh, two completely different Hilbert spaces that are orthogonal and they make up the total phase. So what is the problem? The problem is this. Let's consider a very simple experiment. I have a source, I have a point detector and I'm gonna measure intensity and I'm gonna measure through distributed volume turbulence. The trouble then is, is here's my predicted here and here's my measured. And so if they were exactly correct, they would fall on this line. And the trouble is, is that they don't. And this is what people always talk about by saturation of the Rittoff parameter. So something else is going on. And then the theory as I presented it, can't predict the outcome. So uh, I, I guess, you know, uh, a, a couple of caveats. Uh, I'm drawing a line from the beginning of weak turbulence to where we want to go with what uh, uh, Kent has funded us for. Uh, and there's other folks that might take exception to this. But for what we're presenting here, the theory can't predict the outcome. We have saturation of the Rittoff parameter. All right, so predictive solution is required. So Maxwell's equations can't be solved in closed form because it's random. Uh, Komovorov, uh, there's a lot of things here. As it turns out, this parameter here called the hidden phase is branch point. And that's what Br David's paper in 1998, it was the branch point problem in adaptive optics. That's what this thing is here. So we have an LMS and then we have a branch point phase. So that is that other phase. So uh, what, we, what we have done and what Kent has been funding us to do, uh, he's given us a lot of latitude and I, I, mean, I appreciate that actually. And I think we've been making progress. So hopefully it's working out for the both of us here. Uh, we've been studying branch points for the last uh, five years or so. Uh, so I'm going to talk next about branch points and then go to uh, turbulence induced uh, OAM and then the application to astrophysics. So what do I mean by branch point? What did David really say, you know, when he's talking about branch point? So I have a field F, A, E, V, I, phi. Uh, a branch point is given by two pi circulation of phase and A equals to zero. The amplitude is equal to zero. Uh, a branch point is measured by looking at the phase and looking at the two pi circulation of phase. We have in the lab attempted to uh, 
uh, looks for it in, in amplitude and it doesn't work as well. And I think it's because the detectors are, are, are area detectors. But this actually gives you a very nice way to actually find the, the branch points exist and their location. And what you're going to find in the previous, in the, so we're going to use this to find their location and we'll put dots on the screen and when we get to that I'm going to show you. So that's what branch points are. So branch points in context, we talked about the two types of phase. In the, in the weak turbulence limit, I only get one type of phase. In the strong turbulence limit, I get the, the second type of phase appears. I have a Hilbert space, so now I have two Hilbert spaces. Uh, this Hilbert space starts to become populated, and this is experimental data, uh, So this and this is what it looks like in experimental data. So, all right, so the first thing that we did when we start looking, okay, so now we have problem, the theory is breaking down, we have this thing about branch points, let's talk about branch points. The first result that we did uh, way back, this is about, uh, this is a while ago, uh, branch points are created in pairs of os opposite helicity, helicity and infinitesimally close together. This, call, this follows directly from causality, and uh, causality is described by uniform convergence. So. Let's talk about this, actually, this result that we have here. So causality prevents the wave from changing. What do we mean by causality? So causality, the fastest you can go is the speed of light. You can't go faster than the speed of light. So if I have some time, t, and a time t plus epsilon, the beam cannot change in infinitesimally fast. It has, there's, there's a, I can choose epsilon, so the beam basically has to change smoothly. Uh, this is captured uh, by uh, uniform convergence in the language of convergence. We're gonna, in the language of physics, Let's use mathematics, the uniform convergence. So we're going to consider a, a series of cross-sectional planes given by this. Here we create a set, an F and N, and what we want to do is actually show convergence as it propagates. And uniform convergence is defined here. You know, if, if for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists an N such that for all N greater than N, that this really goes to that. For all X, that's not X squared. That's supposed to be X element of R2. So for all x element of R2, this solution holds. So it holds everywhere simultaneously, and that actually captures causality. So what do we do then? So now, the, the physically, so physics, the physics of it is actually pretty easy. We said, when you look at phase, it's a phase-only disturbance. With additional propagation, this whole new thing appears in the phase. So, so what, and it has to be causal, so it can't change instantaneously. So if I look at some plane, a plane here, less than that, phi is equal to zero. So I actually have uh, an expression here. When I actually have branch points forming, after some points, branch points do form, now I have this additional stuff appearing in the beam. And this, what it does is it creates constraints on how that stuff can form. And that's really what all this comes down to in this whole thing about proving that branch points are created in pairs uh, infinitesimally close together. So of opposite helicity, infinitesimally close together. But let's talk and see about that. So I, I put my picture back up here of a point source propagating to the atmosphere. Uh, assuming here that I create a series of planes. In this place, I could have my observatory down here. The planes go to a certain point, F. So there's my planes that I create, and I create a series of functions there. What I do then, so then I consider a pair of branch points separated by distance d. So now I'm actually saying I am in the, in the, in the the, the field where branch points do exist. And now I consider the function here. I have a function Fn minus F, and I just work through the math here. And I actually get a condition here for, for this solution holding. And if I want it to be less than epsilon, I have to consider here. So now for all d less than d, I have c equals equals m soup, and I have my big d is epsilon over four pi. So causality only holds when I have these pair of branch points, when they're of opposite helicity, and under these conditions here. So you can do this thing, what I did here, so I have a series of planes, I do this uniform convergence, and this has to be done now for pairs of the same helicity, odd numbers of pairs and branch cuts. And uh, when you do that, what you get is you show that causality holds only when branch points are created and infinitesimally close together. I mean, uh, and the creation pairs evolve uniformly. And uh, if you recall on the last slide, I said you have to do it for the branch cuts, and it's the branch cuts that give you this right here, that creation pairs evolve uniformly. There is a problem with this, and, uh, okay, well, there's implications first. Uh, branch points are persistent, period, end of sentence. They can't disappear and disappear. Uh, 
Second of all, branch points have the velocity of the layer that created them, and branch points can yield the di distance of the layer that created them. Those, if, if you go through the math carefully, it actually falls out of the mathematics that we have here. So the trouble is, is this one right here. Branch points are persistent. And this actually caused this paper to sit on my desk for about four years. And the reason is, is every single measurement that you do in will show that branch points are randomly appear and disappear, appear, disappear. And that, that just stopped this, and I couldn't get past it. I couldn't justify how can this be. There's a, there's a physically measurable result, and then there's what we're getting uh, from a theoretical uh, point of view. So it caused the, the, the paper to sit on my desk for a period of four years or so, until one Dennis Osh started doing a set of a remarkable set of experiments on branch points. And uh, this was done in the assault lab, as Kent says. We actually work in the assault lab. Uh, we have uh, an atmospheric simulator that's repeatable. They're on stepper motors, so we can actually repeat them. So Dennis uh, conducted a remarkable set of experiments. And the first set of experiments, actually, Jai Montravati, who's sitting right here in the audience. Hey, Jai. So uh, back in the day. So. All right, so it's what Dennis did. So at Dennis, so I'm going to go actually go through the next, you know, set of slides or the experiments that Dennis did, you know, over the la you know over the last uh, three four years or so. The f what Dennis begins with was a set of phase measurements. If you've seen phase from wavefront sensors, this is ex exactly what it looks like. Uh, he creates a stack of the phase in in, uh, in these. He just lines them up. He takes this, takes a cut at it, and flips it. And this is the first thing that he showed way back. Uh, uh, branch point trails. Uh, I walked into the lab one day and he had this up on the screen and I said, oh my God, that's the answer. This is sort of like breaks the log jam of what we've been sitting there for four years or so. So branch point trails. From branch point trails, uh, what Dennis did is asked estimating the, the velocity of the branch points and you might say, well, what is the velocity? I mean, this is a topological feature of the beam. Right? We have a branch point, it's A equals zero. We have a circulation in phase, and it's a topological feature of the beam. So what does velocity mean? And we're taking it to mean its standard sort of meaning. I have an x2 minus an x1 over delta t. But now I need to, to identify what these x's are. What Dennis does, if you recall, we find the location of the branch points. We take a series of wavefront sensor frames. We actually find the location of the branch points. Dennis does a lot of uh, averaging here. And what he does then is he starts, the supposition, I guess, is this, before I show you what the answer is. The supposition is this, if branch points are truly random, and I were to create velocities of every single pairs of branch points, when I get create a velocity distribution for this, the velocity distribution is going to be uniform. If they're not random, if they truly are sort of repeating, I'm going to get something other than uniform. And what's going to happen here is you can kind of see it in the cartoon. If they're appearing in a line, what's going to happen when I do this velocity distribution is I'm going to get a peak in the velocity distribution. And that's exactly what Dennis did. Uh, he created this. This is lab data. So we actually take branch points. These are the location of branch points. He sums up all the branch points in all the data sets that we have going to forward in time, in space and in time and he gets a velocity distribution, and we see something that's definitely not uniform. We actually get two velocity spikes. So Dennis then went and actually created, he did a whole parameter set of these velocities, of turbulence conditions with different velocities, and he, he plotted them here. And what we're plotting here is measured velocity versus the, 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 the set, experimentally set velocity. So what we would expect is that it would be a straight line. And what you're seeing here is that it is a straight line in a very remarkable set of way. There are error bars on here uh, as well. And th it's such a good estimate uh, that they get buried in the signal there. So the validates the theoretical structure, the theoretical s speculation. So branch points have velocities. So what Dennis then did next was talk about, he went and he measured density of branch points. And what is density mean, it means it has a standard measurement. I have uh, x, y plane of the pupil. I count them and I divide by the area. So Dennis took a set of parameter sets. Here's 121 data sets of varying strength. Uh, he actually measured the, the, the density. And here are the density. And these are various things here are various values of r naught. Uh, as it turns out, if you recall, one of the things that I said early on was that 
when I hit a turbulence layer, no branch points, least mean square only, I propagate further. With further propagation, I get this whole new thing appearing in the phase. And that whole new thing appearing in the phase is branch points. So there's some distance that's associated with the onset of branch points. And what we did then is to actually scale this to that distance, and that distance is a function of strength. Uh, so we take that, we scale it based on distance, and then we scale it based on the, on the turbulence strength. And in doing that, what happens is that the curve, that seemingly random, but not random, you know, it's kind of disparate falling on various parts of it, collapses into a very nice functional form. And Dennis then actually went and actually fit this functional form. So we have a z to 11 6 power with functions of, of the turbulence strength actually gives us a very nice fit to the density. So when we have this thing, people were saying prior, no, branch points are, they appear randomly and disappear randomly. Well, now branch points have velocity. Now branch points have a very well functional form for density as well. And that's what Dennis showed. The next set of what Dennis, the next thing what Dennis showed. All right. He then went and measured separation. And what does separation mean? Uh, if you recall, we have creation pairs. Here's the phase of a creation pair. I showed you the phase of the branch point. Here's a creation pair here. There's a natural sort of geometric construction uh, on branch points that if I have a creation pair here and another creation pair here, there's the intra-pair separation and the inter-pair separation. If you think about it for, for a couple of minutes, you'd say that this inter-pair separation is the density, and that's what I showed you on the last one. It's the inverse of the density, but that's what that is. Now, this intra-pair separation, then, is what we want to measure. So Dennis did. And actually, being able to do this took a lot of time. Uh, we actually built up a lot of machinery in order to be able to do this. So, uh, and if you ask yourself, you know, what I said at the beginning, branch points randomly appear and disappear, the answer what's going to be is that they randomly appear and disappear, but only because of the measurement process. And if you go through these steps here, you'll find that, no, they really don't randomly appear and disappear. They're actually very well defined. So. We start with just frames of measured phase, and here is what we call the polarity array, and there's just, you pick one. We find the locations of the branch points. We create the branch point velocities, and then we group them by the velocities. So now we have velocity classes of branch points. We do the initial frame by frame pairing here, on here. Now we improve the pairing by varying position, pis piston, and in order to find out, that's actually quite important and one of the reasons that people were not able to show this prior. And then we actually overlay the, the, this. And then this distance here, the mean distance here then, is what we call separation, and that's what we'll call a separation. So Dennis did that, and what you see here on the left is the raw data, and then we normalized it by the onset of branch point formation, which I said is a function of turbulence strength. And these are the kind of things that make me chuckle. You know, you kind of you go through all this work, and it took us years to get to this point. And then we go, and we actually go, we go, we go, start reading. You know, Tatarsky. This is Tatarsky said this is a 1971 book. You know, all attempts to determine the mean size from correlation are doomed to failure, since those observations will only give the parameter square root of lambda z. So, what does the separation give us? The square root of lambda z, normalized, but that's okay. So I chuckled when I when I saw that, I read that in Tatarsky, and it just makes me chuckle. So square root of lambda z, a nice set of measurements. Now, uh, persistence. Before I go to persistence, at this point, we start thinking something else really here is going on. Early on here, so this, you know, looking back, you know, kind of looking forward here, um, we're starting to say that branch points are markers for OAM. And this is a speculation that we had, and it took us years to prove it. And so when we're at this point in the research, that's where we were. So, you know, branch points, you know, are markers for these OAM states, but, and, oh, orbital angular momentum, photonic orbital angular momentum. And, uh, and I'm actually going to define it later in the talk when I get to it. So what we wanted to do is actually very, so we we're kind of just going, woohoo, let's go take data. And it was actually getting a bunch of really neat results. And somewhere in here, we actually start going, wait a second, there's this whole other thing that's going on here. So what we want to do very consciously and very specifically is actually go show branch point persistence. And persistence, not merely of branch points, but of the creation pairs. So what I show here is what I was talking about before. I have a series of wavefront tensor frames. We do the circulation algorithm, and then we get points. And we mark the points on array. We color, color them red and green. And if you're from Albuquerque, that can be red and green chili from the two helicities. So 
given that, and also actually interesting enough, in the, our early part of this work, we always called these polarity arrays, and then now when I get toward the end of the talk, I'm gonna start calling them helicity arrays, as, as you'll see. So each dot is the location of the branch point, helicity is marked by red and or green. So what Dennis showed, using the techniques pretty much of the separation was that the branch points are persistent and what we have here is you can see the lines going through here and, and you know uh, it takes a long time to get it to show this very nice and clearly but this is what what we did and you actually have a blow up here and we have the the plus and minus helices and then you actually see them going forward in time so branch points the creation pairs are persistent and this is an amazing result. This is one of those results where you go, woo, yay, because it starts opening the door into what we're going to show next. So, all right, next. All right, uh, actually, it seems like I'm going to take like a left turn here, and I'm going to talk just, uh, Dennis showed in another, another result, and this result is the inner scale is known to influence scintillation, and what Dennis showed is actually influences the inner scale, uh, the, the, the branch point formation as well, and that's what you want to take away from this. I'm going to get back to this in the next section here in about 10 minutes or so. Uh, another thing Dennis did is, if you look at those results that we showed before, they're you know five to 20 kilometers. You say, ah, okay. Uh, we start having this idea in there, our head that we want to apply this to astrophysics. Astrophysics is measured in parsecs, so we want to start extending the range. What happens when we start extending the range? And here's just a, a, a prop. Uh, this is density density versus distance, there's the 11.6 about squared, it rolls off and it begins to fall uh, with additional distance. And one thing, so we have started to do that in the lab, but one thing I'd like to point out here is that's the regime that standard theory applies. There's sort of the saturation regime and then all the rest of the regime is the regime kind of what we're working in. That's, what, that's, what, that's the regime we're working in. So we get then to the next slide. So that's branch points. You know, we talked about theory. There's a standard theory, the, uh, the weak turbulence theory. There is no branch points. There is no hidden phase. It's all noise, actually. And um, we showed then, no, that that's not just noise, that there's actually very, very quite quantifiable. So then what we want to do now is actually talk about turbulence-induced uh, photonic AM, OAM. So what is it? You ask, what is orbital angular momentum and the photonic orbital angular momentum? This is actually in Jackson. If you're actually interesting enough, you know, the way science works is you find, you, 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 you do things, you publish them in papers, and only after 10, 15 years, they appear in textbooks. Interestingly enough, uh, Jackson actually had these definitions of angular momentum. Um, uh, here's just definitions of spin. Uh, spin angular momentum, by the way, is known as polarization. Uh, that's the polarization, and now we're talking about this other, the other part of it right here. So what the kind of the so what is then is this Allen in 1992 showed that, uh, used the results of Jackson and showed that OAM is carried by Laguerre Gaussian beams. And the so what in there is then th th these Laguerre Gaussian beams can be created from Hermite Gaussian beams. Hermite Gaussian beams are basically lasers. So you can actually take a laser, you know, put it through a couple of lenses, and then you get this Laguerre Gaussian beam. So you can actually create these photonic OEM states very well defined in a laboratory. That's what Allen did. So, and the energy ratio is M lambda, uh, beam characteristics, E to IM phi with MH bar of momentum per photon. That's OAM momentum per photon, not the linear momentum per photon. So, that's what photonic orbital angular momentum is. So, then at, at this point, you know, you start looking and say, well, there, you know, there's a superficial similarity between the, the branch points. I mean, they're both circulations in phase. You know, they're both to zero in amplitude. But there's a problem. And, you know, prior, and this is talk about why did this thing sit on my desk for so many years, branch points randomly appear and disappear. Obviously, that needs to be answered. What, how are these branch points created at, uh, conserved at creation? How are they conserved at, pro are they conserved at propagation? And then how on earth does this random process, does this random, the randomly varying thing, create these very well-defined OAM states? So that's where we are, you know. So we showed these actually in the last section, right? Branch points don't randomly appear and disappear. The fact that they're measured to do so is a function of the measurement process. We have a very nice set of theory shows that they are created in pairs, the opposite helicity, they're created at creation, 
conservative propagation. This is really shown in the separation results, you know, we, where we actually, Dennis went and measured the separation. That really is there, but the persistence, he actually published that as a paper saying the information. So all of these were shown in the last section. But now the atmosphere is a random process, and these OEM states are very well defined. They're not going to be there fluctuating randomly. How can you actually show that? So that was one of the things which we did this year. Oh, it's actually last year already. So let's talk about it. Let's go back. So here's the wave equation again. Here's Helmholtz equation, the vector Helmholtz equation. Uh, if you look in the literature, what people will say is that this term couple, couple this term couples polarization states. On experiments looking for this thing have not found it. There's a couple of references where you can find that. And hence it's concluded that this third term, which couples the polarization states, it's actually couples the vector components of the field, is uh, ignored. It's smaller than this one's smaller than that and the third term is ignored. So, but let's think about this for a second. N of R is a random variable. The N of R and its derivative are random variables. So if I want to be comparing the sizes of two things, a random variable and another random variable, I need a metric or a norm in order to do that. So norm equates to size, and for a Hilbert space, the norm is the root of the inner product. So if I can find a Hilbert space, I can actually start looking at the size of index fluctuations. As it turns out, it can be shown that the completion of the space of index fluctuations is, is the Hilbert space. So I have n and I have a one plus a constant and then there's a fluctuating term. The, the completion of this thing here can show be shown to be a Hilbert space in L2. <coughs> so the size, so now at this point then we can say the size of its index fluctuations and its derivative can be found. So now when people, now people just said, well, you know, I kind of haven't seen it so it must be small and one, but now we can actually go with that mechanics that we just built up there. We can actually go start comparing the size of the two terms. So that's what these next slides here, they just go and they compare the, the size of the two terms in that, uh, in, in, the, in the vector Helmholtz equation. So here's the first one, the first one's easy, it's just n. n is bounded by 10 to the minus three or so. It's just the fluctuations of the index of the atmosphere. That's not a problem. The problem then is this one right here. I'm taking the derivative, the derivative of the log of a random variable, and how do I handle this? And what it really, so I expand the log. I do a spectral decomposition, a Riemann Fugel's integral, and then I note that the Fourier transform is isometric. So, no. So do a spectral decomposition with uh, Riemann Fugel's integral, and the Fourier transform is isometric. So now with this, I can actually began to look at this. So what I want to do, what, what's the, the plan here? The plan here is this. Uh, I have a wave, it's fluctuating. And it's fluctuating, I take the derivative of it. The faster it fluctuates, the more, the higher, the bigger the derivative is. So that's what we want to do here. We actually want to look at this. So uh, del log n, so I have my derivative here. So to one part in 10 to the third, I can show that the derivative is this. I can show the del e dot del, and then I take the, the random, the, the ensemble average, and I can actually show then that the c d kappa kappa to the fourth times the function of the, times the spectrum. So what can I do now? Now I can actually start comparing the size of the two terms. The size of the two terms then, so I have the third term over the second term, I have my expressions, and I get my, my function here of the, of the, my ratio here. So now I have lambda squared. If you call lambda squared, lambda is 10 to the minus sixth in the optical. So in the optical range, since this is, so this is 10 to the minus 13th, 14th, and then I have an integral. The trouble is, is this integral is unbounded. So if I compare the size of these two terms in the Kolmogorov spectrum, I find that this ratio goes to infinity for kappa large. So. And this is a problem. And the reason this is a problem is that we don't see this. So, but now, if you recall, we're on page slide nine or 13, uh, what I showed here was that there are other spectrums that account for the inner scale. And if we actually go use the von Karman spectrum here, I calculate the ratio and I, cal and I get a function here of lambda squared. And then I can actually evaluate this numerically and I can show then that this is around 10 to the minus sixth. 10 to the minus seventh to, to 10 to the minus fifth 
on here. So this is on the cusp of detectability. So now, act, all right, I'll come back to this in a second. All right, so we can then show that in general that this is insoluble. The third term is known to couple the vectorial states of E. And with the Kolmogorov spectrum, it's shown to be arbitrarily large. We know that's false. But with the von Karman spectrum, we can actually show that it's on the order of this M lambda. So we then conclude that turbulence creates OAM. And these branch points are markers for the OAM states. So uh, let me, before I go on here, actually, people have actually gone and measured this. And this is what I thought you were getting to. And people have actually, the last set of experiments that I saw that went to, to measure this was a Japanese uh, team by Fukujima. They did it in 2010. They had a satellite. They're going to use it for laser communication. They're going to use the polarization states for laser communication. They went to see how much of this term could be measured. They found it was a null experiment. Uh, the precision of their experiment was 10 to the minus third. So what we're showing here is that we need to see one, five parts in 10 to the minus seventh. So you needed a resolution of about one part in 10 to the minus seventh in order to measure this effect. So yes, they are null experiments, but we haven't had the, the resolution to measure them yet. So, all right. Uh, Dennis then went into the lab and actually showed that branch points have a precursor phase. And this is a very interesting result. And you say precursor phase is unique with an exclamation point. This is the kind of thing that kind of scratches my head. Well, first of all, this is just this is a, this is a, one of those really nice results that Dennis gets out of the lab. And one of the things that you can show here then is that OEM states can be generated using a deformable mirror. And you say, so what? The so what is people have been talking about uh, uh, QKD and actually using QKD to actually encode, you know, to, to encrypt. What they've found is that as you propagate through the atmosphere, the the the, the OEM states decohere. What we've found if you recall that 150 kilometer plot is if they're created in pairs of opposite velocity, we're not seeing the decoherence, interestingly enough. So this is an exclamation point here, where, and it scratches my head. And if you think carefully about what I said in the last section about the, the I create the Helmholtz equation, I look at the, si the size of the two terms, that gives us an indication that there is a physical mechanism for the creation of OAM. This is starting to say, some other things that we haven't published yet. So more on that later. So what have we done then? So we started with the superficial similarity between branch points and uh, zero and, and, and uh, OAM. We showed that there are problems with equating that, but we've addressed the problems one after the other. Branch points are persistent. They are conserved in the sense that the helicity is conserved. They're conserved at creation and uh, the atmosphere is a random process that can create these. So, all right, so with that then, so what we've done then, so we have turbulence, we have photonic uh, uh, turbulence, we have turbulence creating branch points, we have branch points uh, being markers for photonic OAM. So now what we want to do is talk about astrophysics. And, and this is interesting, one of those things where you sit around and you think, you know, okay, I have, we've been doing this work in atmospherics, and you kind of take a deep breath, put your hands behind your head, let your deep breath out. And you kind of realize that what I just did there is I inhaled and exhaled a molecular cloud. That's, that's really all it comes down to. So, this molecular so if we then start looking at astrophysics and considering the molecular clouds in astrophysics, and that's what we want to do here. So I love this picture, and it's not showing up. This is a lovely picture. This is a picture was taken by Rob Johnson. And unfortunately, all you can see is a big line coming up here, which is the sodium beacon and the light pollution of Albuquerque. Up here in the upper left corner, which you can't see if it was, is a picture of the Milky Way. And this is a standard picture of the Milky Way. You go on the web, you'll actually see this. The Milky Way, if you actually see it, it's like this band of bright clouds, and then right in the middle of it, there's this darkness. And you go, what is this darkness? That darkness is the dust and molecular clouds that you're looking through to see to into the, the, the heart of the Milky Way. And that's what we actually want to, we are interested in, in ap applying our results to astrophysics. So. The atmosphere is a molecular cloud. Turbulence is density fluctuations. What you then can show is that if, now you just sit back and now think about it for a second. We have to actually apply it mathematically and physically. But uh, if we go back to this, the, the image in the Orion nebula, nebula of trapezium, we actually start seeing these density fluctuations. So physically, from a physics point of view, what we want to say then, yes, is the, the universe is created composed of a good deal of hydrogen, 
and these, this hydrogen and these clouds have density fluctuations, then our previous results apply. So in particular, the cosmos is 80% hydrogen, and here's actually the dielectric constants to say, yes, they are there. Uh, the bottom line is that if I look at this term for hydrogen versus air, it's approximately half, and hence galactic clouds will create branch points and hence OAM. The same exact phenomena that we're seeing here in, in Earth's atmosphere is going to be seen in astrophysics. Now, if you actually go back to what, you know, Allen's results in 1992, uh, one of the reasons it's so uh, fundamental, it's so being so widely used now is prior to his results, if you look at uh, um, uh, uh, photons, what are the things that you can measure in photons? You can measure intensity, right? you can measure correlation, you can measure frequency, and you can measure polarization. What Allen said in 1992 is that there's a fifth thing that you can measure, and that's the photonic OAM as an intrinsic property of the photon. So that's what uh, Allen did. So now what we're saying then is this thing that this, this fifth property that uh, Allen pointed out in 1992 is actually going to be ubiquitous in the cosmos. That's what this is saying. So uh, branch points are markers for OAM, turbulence and conversion process. Oh, yes. The problem with one of, well, everything that we've done prior, in some sense, we kind of don't care what the photon flux is. If we're going to apply it to astrophysics, they really care what the photon fluxes are. You know, if we're applying it in the lab, we kind of don't care. It's like doing a Young's double slit, slit experiment. We kind of don't care. We care that there's fringes there, right? But the, f the location of the fringes and the spacing of the fringes gives you no information about the flux. So what we want to do if we want to apply it to astrophysics is actually start getting an estimate of the flux, of the photon flux. So this is what it is. And now we come back to those Hilbert spaces that we talked about in the beginning of the, of the talk. Uh, so we can actually, it can be shown that the ratio of the converted photons can be estimated first order by the, the ratio of the sizes of the Hilbert spaces. And theoretical calculations can be done. If you recall, I said there was a z to the 11 six or z squared. Uh, there it's showing up again. It's showing up. The theory really says it goes to one, uh, but it doesn't account for saturation. If you recall, I talked about saturation before. So we did this theoretically. And after we did this theoretically, we actually went back and reanalyzed some data we had taken like four years ago. And uh, well, we, we being Dennis, uh, went back and analyzed it. So what I'm plotting here is the size of the Hilbert space. Verse, so this is the size of the Hilbert space. This is distance, width distance. The black curves here are the, the slope discrepancy Hilbert space, and the blue curves are the LMS Hilbert space. And each one of these is a different turbulence strength. I then actually calculate the conversion ratio, and I show this is just wonderful match. You know, this is time you need to talk about go woohoo again. This is another woohoo moment because you actually go and you do this theory, you actually do the theory, you actually go in the lab and you actually measure it. Oh, goodness. So it was amazing. So, uh, so anyway, so there's a set of uh, 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 a conversion efficiency. And you might actually, one of the things I didn't mention before was when Alan actually showed that, and he talked about conversion of the, the Hermit Gaussian to the Gehr Gaussian beam, one of the things, it's a conversion process, and that's one of the things he did. So if I take a, a Hermit Gaussian beam, uh, a cylindrical lens, a propagation, and another cylindrical lens, that's all it takes to create these other beams. So. And now what we've done then is it's a conversion process. And now we actually look at the atmosphere then as a conversion process of m equals zero to m equals plus minus one states. So, and that's what this is here. So we have that 150 kilometer data. Uh, so last one was the size of the Hilbert space versus turbulent strength. This is the size of the Hilbert space versus the inner scale. And Dennis took a lot more data. These are the size of the Hilbert space. Here's simulation. Here's experiments. Uh, here is the conversion efficiency. So it goes up, and it approximately approaches 60% of the total flux. What's my time hack here? How, how far am I? What's my time hack? Uh, I, what's that? I have to wrap up? OK, very good. So uh, anyway, so 60% of the poem flux. Uh, uh, so we actually show. Uh, all right. So. Application astrophysics. Galactic molecular clouds are ubiquitous. Galactic sources are ubiquitous. Hence, there are steady, long-lasting astrophysical poem fluxes. So as an outcrop of our results. So summary, <coughs> turbulence creates branch points. Branch points are markers for OAM. 
since molecular clouds are ubiquitous in the galaxy, home fluxes will through exist throughout the cosmos. I am not telling you what the home fluxes are yet. Um, in short, the whole universe is spinning. So I'll end with that. So questions, do I have time? Did I talk too long? Okay. Well, so actually, all right. So, well, if no one has questions, I guess uh, I had two questions. And oh, you have one. Oh, we have one. It may be a bit more technical than we have here, but when you're talking about um, the von Karman spectrum mm -hmm. and the Schmalgerov spectrum, the mm -hmm. von Karman spectrum gives mm -hmm. you a certain term. Uh -huh. Is there a way to now you've measured the terms to go back and say now is there a better spectrum to use than even von Karman? Can you can you generate the spectrum? <coughs> I would like to actually go measure the spectrum uh, instead of doing it. Can you say, is there a better spectrum? And I, 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 say, I don't know. Uh, if, if you know, I, um, we're at, we, have, we just have a program called Civil uh, Characterization of Earth's Boundary Layer, and this is done by Tom Farrell. You actually saw some of that. We briefed that last week. Uh, one of the things that we want to do is actually go back and measure the inner scale. If you actually look at the von Karman spectrum, this is the Kent, what Kent is saying. If you actually look at it, they just, they did heuristically, they said I had E to the minus kappa, basically, is what happens. And, and so that's about as heuristic as it gets. And, and, but if you actually saw, there, I presented two sets of results. One which showed the branch points are, 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 are functions of the, of the inner scale, and the inner scale makes a difference. So we need to actually go measure it. And I, I don't, uh, if I were a fluid dynamist, if there are fluid dynamicists out there, they could, I think they could go and solve that. I, d I can't. I'm not a fluid dynamicist. So, so anything else? So actually, I. I Go ahead. Uh, okay. I if you have any, had something else? Oh, I was, I was going to say there's there's a couple of questions. I don't know what tip our time had here. So the uh, we already answered one of the questions, and that's the question of the size of the um, of that third component. And people have gone out and measured it. You know, and the other one was the the the, the gauge invariant. Actually, that's another question that people have brought up about this thing, and people have shown a gauge, the short answer is that people have shown gauge invariance, it was done by Inc. in 1994. So those are the two, I think, big criticisms of the work, and, uh, but those are the two answers to the criticism. Okay, Jerry? I don't know. I, I mean, I, it, this is very interesting. I, you know, if you have this, uh, if you actually look out, it, it, people, you, you say that there's five, four, historically four uh, things that people look at. Okay, let me take a step back. When you look at the cosmos, you can only use it at using electromagnetic radiation. That, that's really all it comes down to, right? And, and this has to do with the interaction of, of, of how they are. And there's four things that, that they could use. One of them is polarization. I mean, there's obviously intensity and correlations and whatnot. Those are used just uh, all the time. The ones that aren't, isn't used a whole lot is polarization. So the question really that you're asking is, you know, what effect is something like this going to have on how we're going to go? And I don't know yet. And that's actually where we are. One of the things that I didn't tell you, hmm, I should have said this. Ah, oh, this is in my notes, and I didn't say this. Um, we have a set of on-sky measurements, okay? I actually, we actually, the thing that I showed you back here, here, and I, this is actually uh, going to be uh, sent off to ANA Astronomy and Astrophysics when I get back. Uh, this is sort. This follows very just one for one logically from what we I presented in the first half, and it's in the literature. Uh, we also went out. Um, I work at an observatory. I asked the folks there to actually go take data for us, and so they did. So we have a series of on sky data, and I'm not going to tell you what the answer is, and you can read it here hopefully uh, shortly. Uh, in preparation, that's not a strong enough statement. I mean, the stronger statement is I work at a government laboratory, so I can't just publish stuff. This has gone, went to PA over a month ago. I was just leaving for my trip, and I got an email that it's been approved, so I said, uh, with uh, minor changes. So I, I need to go back, and as soon as I get back, hopefully things will, well, probably Friday, I'll actually upload it. So the answer to your question is, is I, I, I don't know yet. I mean, uh, the one where it might have more application is, is in the PKD. You know, people have shown um, 
Oh, I'm glad you asked this, John, because this gets back to my 60%. Uh, uh, it can actually show that people, if you try to uh, propagate through the atmosphere, that the states decohere. If they propagate the Laguerre-Gaussian beams through the atmosphere, the states decohere. And what that means then, if I put in a state M, and when I start, I soon I say M equals plus one, I see M equals minus one, and it just grows, and that's the decoherence. We're not seeing the decoherence. So not only are we not seeing the decoherence, experimentally we're saying the poem flux reaches about 6% of the total flux. See, this is highly suggestive, because this is about two thirds. Now two thirds means that it's equipartitioning into the three states, M equals zero, M equals plus minus one. We, we haven't shown that, but uh, this is so highly suggestive. It just, uh, those things that, you know, I kinda, there's plenty of work here to do, that's what I'm saying. So I, I don't know, it's pro if it's gonna happen, it's gonna ha probably happen in QKB. Maybe I misunderstood you when you were talking about the, the, the cosmos. Of, does it bother you that some of these hydrogen atoms are thousands of light years apart? Uh, oh, this, oh, oh, yeah, this is a very other yeah, nice. I mean, not, we're not seeing anything that has anything to do with each other. Oh, this is a very good question, and this kind of gets back to Kent's inner scale. People have actually gone out and measured in pulsar for pulsar scintillation the inner scale of parsecs, and this is for electron densities. It's not for what we're talking about here. So yes, it does bother me, and, uh, the cr and but there's other things that bother me as well, and there's extinction, and there's a bunch of other things. But even if it's created in, in situ and, and, and then absorbed, that's okay, because what it's doing is it's leaving traces. There's indirect measurements as well. The, everything that you saw here is direct, direct measurements. All right, so, uh, but, so, I guess, so for pulsar scintillation, people have shown that, and those things that, that are so far apart, uh, they still see it it's on the order of kiloparsecs, which is amazing if you actually go look at what they've done. So, so yes, and so there are, there are, there are a lot of questions uh, that they need to be answered. And the only thing that I'm saying is, you know, we're, we're, we're making a lot of progress, you know, and it kind of, it's interesting, you know, when Kent first started funding with us, you know, this to do this way back in the day, I, I wouldn't have predicted all of this here. So, you know, we're right at the cusp there of actually doing some, I think some things that are very remarkable. I enjoy doing it too, so. Thank you. Uh, before we thank our speaker for again, I'd like to present him with a 60 per 60th anniversary commemorative coin Excellent. from AF Pulsar. Excellent. And thank you for being a part of our series. Yeah. Thank, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Limited edition. Limited edition. Excellent.